child Samuel that lays there. This morning, we have the good pleasure of welcoming and um, having in the pulpit Reverend Izzy, Israel Alvarand. He comes originally from the Philippine Annual Conference. And one of the things that I like to think, we have people that are going like this, whoot, whoot, um, yeah. right, now, right now, Izzy. Yes, there are. Um, but one of the things that I think about when I think about Izzy is the fact that he's one of those p- folks that like the, our call to worship. Remember about the voice calling and responding? Izzy's one of those great examples of the people that have leaned in, heard their name, and responded in a prophetic, powerful way. So you can take a look if you'll take out your messenger and you can find out more about what he's doing. Um, but in between the printing and currently, um, Izzy has actually changed jobs, interestingly. But he hasn't changed vocations, right? He's changed jobs, but he has not changed vocations. Meaning that his heart in the Philippines was as a rabble rouser, and he continues to do that here. Um, and what he's going to be now doing is actually working for our national body, the General Board of Church and Society, as a national organizer of economic justice. And so as we think about today, Human Relations Day, and what that means for us here in Oakland, Chinatown, whether we are in college or younger, or whether we have retired and are wondering what the rest of our life is about, we can still open our hearts, open our ears, and listen for that call that comes to be about the way of Jesus. So let us welcome Reverend Izzy. Um, to the pulpit and to open our hearts and listen. There you go. I'm not that small. <laughs> uh, I'll just hold this. She wanted me to wear the clip microphone. I was telling her that I've had horror stories about it. <laughs> Things you say when you don't know that you have a microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> later, later, I guess, we'll read through other parts of, um, of Samuel, the reading, uh, especially the bad news that Samuel had to tell Eli, that part, you know, um, which is also part of the readings for today. Now, who among you here would pick up a phone call if you knew, if you didn't know whose number it was? Really? I won't. I mean, I don't. Nor, <laughs> if I don't recognize the number, it's not on my, you know, my list of contacts. I, I let it go to voicemail, you know, normally. But then, you know, uh, as an organizer, you have to check your voice messages at least like before the day ends, so you need to make those calls. But normally, I don't. So I usually get a lot of like voice messages. Sometimes in two days, I get like thirty messages because I get calls from my numbers like out there unfortunately. And so I'm bad at picking up calls from people that, you know, I don't know. But like Samuel in our reading, I got the call when I was young. Um, I went to one of those children's camps and I was in fifth grade. And I said, when I grow up, I, I would want to serve the church full time and serve God through the church full time as a minister. And so I did after High school, I went to Bible college and then went on to seminary. And um, at age 20, I think, or yeah, 20, before I went to seminary for uh, the Master's of Divinity degree in the Philippines, I was assigned as a minister um, in, in a very like small church. It's actually a mission church. And my first Sunday at that church in the 19... 19- 89, <laughs> so you could guess my age, um, 1989, the first service we had was under a tent, right next to the church being built, it was me, a deaconess playing, you know, the organ, using the, you know, you know those old school organs where you have to pump it with your, yeah, pump organs, they can actually carry it, and I was, I, I had, I lived in a member's house, which is probably a couple of blocks away from where the church was, I carried the folding table for communion, and I had all the stuff, you know, and there were four of us, me, the deaconess, and two members, and, you know, we had cows and goats roaming around. That was my first, my first church service. But then I remember that I responded to the call when I was five years old. And 
When I was born, let me tell you just like the story of my car, right? My dad uh, was a new convert to being Methodist, but my mom was Roman Catholic. And the deal was, before I was born, when they got married, the deal was my dad being a very zealous Methodist, our wedding is gonna be in a Methodist church. And so my mom's family agreed against tradition, which was you, know, you need to get married in the woman's tradition. But the deal was the baby, the firstborn, will be baptized Catholic. <laughs> huh? Good deal, right? My dad agreed to it. And so I was baptized Catholic. Uh, I was baptized in the Catholic church, um, the Chiapo church, which is a big cathedral. So Filipinos here would probably know where that church is. Big church. And I was baptized there. A couple of weeks after that, my dad secretly <laughs> brought me to a Methodist church on the outskirts of Manila to, you know, the pastor of that church was like a former pastor of his home church. And so they were friends and brought the baby, me, and I was baptized. And I think the pastor just got whoever from the congregation to be a witness. I, my dad didn't even know them. And so secretly I was baptized. So I was growing up, my, my aunties, on my mother's side would always whisper to me, you're actually Catholic, <laughs> you know, because I was being raised Protestant. So I guess I had the best of both worlds. But that experience of being baptized in that church, you know, really connected to me because the first time, my, the first church that I served as an ordained minister of our denomination was that same church where I was baptized. And so that first Sunday of 92, when I, uh, preached at the church where I was baptized, they didn't know. I had this old book where, you know, have there all the listings of the baptisms. I had that dusty book at the pulpit and show them I was baptized in this church. And now I said, I'm ordained, I'm your minister, and we're having communion today, right? So I said, I have gone for full circle where the sacraments of the church, which is baptism and communion, for me, was happening right there at the same time. Why am I telling you this? Because I believe that our call to ministry is to be a sacrament, to be a conduit, to be an instrument of God's grace to other people, to our family, to our community. Having said that, you know, that we all are called then to ministry. There are people who probably are called to different kinds of ministry, but I believe in the priesthood of all, belie priesthood of all believers, which is a very Protestant uh, belief. We are all God's priests. You know, Emily and I probably get to wear the fancy robes, but you can too. But no, all of us are called to be in ministry. And we will go through that today, you know that God is calling us. And Samuel, the boy that we just read about, was called at a very young age. He was called in the middle of the night. <laughs> There's something ominous about that. And he was called to say something that's probably not good. You know, the news that he was to bring to Eli wasn't really good news, you know? And we will go through that. The first thing that I wanted to share with you in this ministry that we are called to is that first, God calls us into the realm of the impossible, which is beyond our imagination. Let me just like try to wow you first with that before we go into the bad stuff, you know, like the things you don't want to hear. God calls us into something that's beyond your imagination. And if I'll, I'll, I'll give myself as an example. Um, when, I, when I answered the call, of course I was a young kid, but when I, it was fun, like, oh, camp, the pastor was asking, who here is hearing God's call? And because I was like raised Sunday school, I would always go with my father to Bible studies. There would be Bible studies at my house. I loved being around the ministers, you know, in the church, and they were all like, well, especially when they knew that I wanted to be a minister, they really took care of me. They would always, you know, talk to me, gave me all the attention that this boy is going to be one of us. 
Then, when I was after Bible college, I was sent to the boonies. They said, we want to test you before we pay for your education. <laughs> before we pay for your Master of Divinity, let's, let's have you do mission work for one year. And I told you that my first Sunday, right? Now, there were times, the first time it happened when the support from the district was late. And I was broke. You know, I lived in this small room, and now I have to walk instead of taking public transportation to do my house visits and the Bible studies, right? And before I left that day, when I knew that I wasn't getting any money for at least a week or so, I said, God, you called me to this work. You will provide. But then at the back of my mind, I was like, okay, let's, let's just do this. I'm just going to go out there walk like probably a mile or two to the next house that I'm supposed to visit. When I got there, we prayed, we talked, you know, and before I left, um, the member of that church said, Pastor, before you leave, you know, my dad just visited me from his province where they grow a lot of rice, right? And he brought me like a, a sack of rice. And I was actually actually waiting for your visit because I have like two bags of rice waiting for you. Oh, I love rice. <laughs> you know, I can survive with rice and fish sauce. And so there it was, two bags of rice for me to take home. And I was praising God all the way back to the parsonage. I said, I need to drop this off first before I go, because I can't be carrying, like, you know, how many kilos of rice. And I was praising God. I got back to the, you know, my room. I knelt, knelt down. And pray, like, God, thank you so much for providing me with this food. Basic, my basic, you're, you, you really are great, God. And then I said, towards the end of my prayer, but, you know, rice really goes well with something else. <laughs> you know, you got something, right? It has, you know, I mean, that was, I was 20 years old. Who here is like 20 years old? I was 20 years old, first time to be away from my folks, from, you know, civilized life, but it's a city, but it was like four hours south of Manila. Before that prayer, my prayer ended, there was someone knocking at my door. There was someone knocking at my door, another church member. And then so I went down, didn't even get to finish my prayer. Because I knew whose voice he was. He said, I'm a member of the church. You know, some of those, you know, a member of the church that you knew would always bug you. <laughs> I guess so. So I said, okay, somebody needs prayer. I went down. This lady was carrying a basket of fish that was cooked in such a way that they made it, like they cooked it, I think, in water and something else, in salt, that would last you a week. And lots of fresh tomatoes to go with it. God calls us to something impossible beyond your imagination. All you need to do is respond and say, I'm here. Ever since, ever since that time when I said, I believe you called me, God has never been lacking. I've had to, been through difficult times. And I was just telling um, Emily earlier, uh, that the organization that I'm working with just like has like is going through a lot of financial problems as with a lot of nonprofits these days it's clergy and lady united for economic justice which is also my Episcopal appointment um, and I took a voluntary layoff effective January 12th and I didn't know where I was going I wasn't sure I said leap of faith and also probably because I needed some rest but on the same day that I was laid off, the official layoff date, that's when I got a call from the General Board of Church and Society and said they're offering me this work to be our denomination's national organizer for economic justice. I said this is, again, a proof of God's call. We just need to be prepared for the uncertain, but then God sees beyond the horizon of what we see, beyond what we can imagine. 
beyond what is possible for us. God sees that. God knows that. And that God will provide for us in that way. Another story in Santa Monica. A couple of workers from different hotels were trying to negotiate a fair contract. Two of the hotels signed the contract. One hotel did not sign a contract yet, has not signed at that time. And the rabbis, the clergy in Santa Monica wanted to show something. It was around Passover. Wanted to provide public witness. And so they went around and went to the two church, uh, to two, the two hotels where they signed a contract and offered them milk and honey in Thanksgiving. And then the hardline hotel general manager, who happened to be an Orthodox Jew, you know, received the clergy led by the rabbis, because it was around Passover, and gave him bitter herbs. Being an Orthodox rabbi, an Orthodox Jew, he immediately knew what that meant because in the Passover Seder, that meant, you know, the pain of being a slave in Egypt, the bitterness of that. Saying that your workers are going through that same situation, so you better sign a contract. He immediately got the message. He said, Am I Pharaoh? Am I Pharaoh? That simple act of public witness touched that manager's heart and they signed the contract. Seemed impossible. But then when you stand up in an act of faith, not shy of the gospel, not shy of the message that you bring, not shy of the music that you sing and the songs that we bring, the symbols of our faith, when you're not shy, God will work wonders. When I first came to this country, I felt like, oh, faith is so much in, you know, not, it's too personal that people don't want their faith to be speaking in the public square. But we're, from where I come from, every time we have mass actions and demonstrations, it's always preceded by a mass because we're 80% Roman Catholic, right? And half of me is kind of like Catholic. <laughs> I got the best of both worlds. But when, you know, when you're not shy to bring that faith to the fore and let your faith speak in the public square, God can work through you. Like Samuel, when he responded, Speak, Lord. I can hear you talking to me. I guess you need to check your voice mailbox, which is the title of our message, right? Now, the second part, God calls us in the middle of the night. I hate calls like that <laughs> because it scares me. If I get a call from my mom at 3 in the morning, something's up. You're scared. It scares you, right? I remember, unfortunately, a member of that church that I served, in, the first church as a minister, an ordained minister, her huge house caught on fire. She was our annual conference treasurer. She had a big house. It, it, it caught on fire. And the youth of the church started waking me up. I, they, they said, Pastor, it's 2 in the morning. Pastor, you know, um, Olivia's church is, you know, Olivia's house is on fire. And my, my first reaction was like, you should call the firefighters, not me. <laughs> you know? But they were like, come and pray for them, of course, right? Uh, but you get those calls kind of, something's wrong, right? Something's wrong. God calls us in the middle of the night of our lives when there are difficult news to bring. And that's what happened to Samuel. Let me go back to that reading. Then the Lord said, this is verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that I will make both ears of anyone who hears it, of it, tingle. Oh, that's things that you don't want to hear. But that's what God wanted to tell him. Young boy, you need to tell Eli this. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. 
Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the inequity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. In short, God was pissed. That's all. I God was pissed. You're supposed to be a priest to lead the church or the temple. But you have all of these bad things, corruption probably, blaspheming, you know, all that that you're doing. Young boy, please tell him that this is not going to pass. That I'm going to have to do something about it. Do you like to be a bearer of bad news? Well, we have the good news. But some people think that the good news does not contain the bad news too, because it does. The gospel can be offensive. It should be. When you're confronted and God tells you that you're a sinner, that is something you don't want to hear. That's something nobody wants to hear. That you did not pass the test. But before you go to the good news of God's grace, you have to first share that bad news that you did not pass the test. That God threw down the plumb line of your wall and found your wall leaning in the wrong direction. You have to confront people and tell them the bad news that you have so much that God has given you and yet you offer so little for your community. Shouldn't there be equity in taxation? There should be. God tells you, I have called you and accepted you for who you are, but how come church there are still people you would not open your doors to. And you know who they are. People we don't want in church. Or people we think should not be in church. For who they are. Sometimes the law and the structure of the church needs to be corrected. For sometimes it is leaning towards those who already have everything in life. Ethical investments. Where do, we, where do we invest our resources? Notre Dame University, a lot of universities that are big with endowments, Ivy League schools, some of them Vanderbilt, which is a Methodist institution, they actually invest in a corporation called HEI that runs sweatshop hotels where workers don't have a voice on the job. Shouldn't we be calling on these institutions to divest from corporations that do not provide a decent life for their workers? How about immigrants? We are all children of immigrants, we always say. But then the other seems to be so other for us. Like, can we open the borders of this country and take the borders down from across the world? We live in one planet. Corporate personhood. You know, the decision of the Supreme Court, Citizens United, made corporations persons. But corporations are not created in God's image. The bottom line for corporations is profit. And our denomination believes that people should come before profit. It's very clear. While our book of resolutions and our social principles and social creed may not be church law, but they should persuade us. Because God made human beings in God's image. And they are holy and sacred. And if there's a rival person saying, too bad. You're just a commodity. You're just one of my workers. I get money and out of your labor power, but not give you a fair wage, a just wage. There's an issue there. Discrimination. 
in our church or in our community, that still exists. Some people said, oh, now that we have a president who's black, we're post-racial. That's a lot of crap. It's not true. And as, you know, if you're, if you're a person of color, you exactly know what I'm talking about. I have heard people say that in my face, but not insinuating it's about me, that not all people, and this was a well-meaning person, an, an organizer from one of the unions, told me that, you know, not everybody is genetically disposed to be a community organizer. That is racist. That is racist. So you're telling me I'm a brown person and <laughs> I'm not genetically disposed to do the work? Of course not. Another example, and I'll read her story to you. This is, her name is Victoria Guillen. A lot of my stories about hotel workers, because I worked with them for four years, and they have like fabulous stories. Victoria Guillen, he, she said, in 2009, I was pregnant. Having a child is a beautiful and joyous thing. But when I was pregnant, the managers at the Grand Hyatt, Union Square in San Francisco where she worked, acted like it was wrong. It was a difficult, high-risk pregnancy, and on my doctor's orders, I had to take a long leave of absence. A month before my due date, Hyatt told me that I had used up all of my medical leave, and if I didn't return to work three days after my due date, they did not want me back at all. Three days after cesarean section, will you go to work? The Hyatt managers refused to understand that I could not return to work so soon. They refused to have any compassion. When I left my meeting with the managers, I was so upset, I had a debilitating headache and ended up being hospitalized. My daughter was born by cesarean section, and she's now a healthy and happy toddler. I did not return to work three days after the operation because no one could have done that. My coworkers, my coworkers supported me, and they offered a deal. Management offered a deal to give my job back, but just for me, a special deal. But I knew that there were two other pregnant housekeepers, my coworkers. And so I said no to their proposal unless it included everybody else and that it was a policy. My, I got support from my workers, and I got my job back, and I got that deal because we stood up. And I named my daughter Cielo Victoria because it was heaven's victory. She was a person of faith. She's a person of faith. I've heard other workers say, I pray to the Lady of Guadalupe every day, and that's why I know we will win this fight. Will you join us in the struggle for justice? Will you join the church in sharing somewhat difficult news that our society is being judged according to God's standards? When God said that, you know, when Scripture says that everybody is marked and made in the image of God, sealed by the Spirit, what does that mean? That means every human being is sacred before God. When God said that all creation is good, the created order is sacred to God. And when it is abused, when even one child is hungry, judgment from God will surely come because we have been entrusted this world with enough resources for everyone. But we, what, we do, what do we do? We shut down our borders and say, well, too bad. You live on the other side of the border. If you want to come here illegally, fine. But then if we find you, we'll deport you while you're helping our economy go on. What kind of treatment do we give to people? Regardless of who they are and their color, they are God's children. We are all God's children. Very, very basic. The theology around creation and us being made in God's image. And like what I said earlier, the gospel can be offensive. But I heard Reverend Glenda Hope, who I work with a lot in San Francisco, 
she shared this, you know, testimony, her own testimony before other people of faith in San Francisco. And she said one time that if we are to offend, if we are to offend anyone, let the gospel be our offense. It hurts. Your ears burn. But that's what God told this boy. You have to tell Eli, which he did. Now, third, God calls us in person, but also through others not like us, or not from amongst us, or using others who probably we don't even like. Now, God delivered that message to Samuel in person. It was in a phone call. And if you read the scriptures, it said, God came and stood before him. That's pretty rare. Nobody sees God. And when you see parts of scripture where God is being shown to take on some form that you can see, that's something big. That happens very few in the Old Testament. One is Moses, the burning bush. And when he received the Ten Commandments, he couldn't even look into the face of God because that's what it is. It, it, if you cannot look at the face of God because you will die. That's, what this, that's a theology around it, right? But then we have this man, Jesus. What do we do with this guy? If you read the Gospel reading today, Nathaniel said, What good will come out of Nazareth? Because his brother was coming like, I just met this guy. He's so awesome. He knows so many things about me. And he called me to work for him and work with him. And then his brother was like, a guy from Nazareth? Sometimes you have that kind of attitude too, right? When the bearer of the message is, is carrying a message that we don't like to hear, we easily dismiss it and say, a bunch of hippies. Right? A bunch of hippies. You know? All they do is just sit there in their encampment, occupied, you know, the plaza in front of, uh, of City Hall, and they're rabble rousers. I don't trust them. They're a bunch of hippies. But you know, sometimes God calls people not from amongst us. People sometimes we don't even trust or know. Jesus is an example. Rabble rouser. The lepers around those days, like you know, Jesus helped them out and used them to show the message that there are people you don't even want to hug, but they bear the gospel. The Samaritan as an example. Jews didn't like them. They were half-blood Jews. They were not pure. Sometimes we're like that. Is that guy Methodist? <laughs> Or is he, is he really like a full-blooded American? The immigrant amongst us bear that message too. The workers struggling for justice and just a fair wage bears God's message to us if we only listen. Martin Luther King Jr. I can imagine around that time a black preacher at a time when there was segregation, racism was like blatant, and you have there a man of God. And a lot of people nowadays forget that he's actually a preacher. And that the message that he, was, he brought about civil rights was rooted in his faith. A lot of people forget that now and has secularized MLK. He is a man of faith. And now we have this movement around us. The Occupy movement, the encampments are gone, but you know, but like what they said, you cannot evict an idea. Is God calling us through these people? Maybe. Are we open though to listen? Are we open to listen to what they're saying about the 99%, which is probably all of us? If you look at the prophets, the list of the prophets. Have you seen a prophet that came from the priesthood? 
Do you know of a prophet in scripture that came from the priesthood? Because the prophet's office is so designed to hold all of us accountable. Because sometimes we forget. We get wrapped up in our ritual. We get wrapped up in our ideas that we are already doing what is good. And what we always say, oh, we forget about what God really wants. We're so busy building God's kingdom or kingdom, but we actually forget that our God is walking amongst the other in our midst. Now, I would like to end with this fourth part of the message. Given this knowledge of how God communes with us, what is our vision of the world? What is the message? What is our vision? And I, I, would, I, I listed this down. I would like to read it. Because God knows, because God's love knows no borders, we dream of a world without borders. Goods and services cross borders so easily because of these free trade agreements, but workers who make these corporations rich are slapped with deportations and family separations. That is not what the gospel mandates us because we know that God loves us regardless. We dream of a world where people can savor and enjoy the work of their hands and share in the responsibilities of upholding the common good. A standard whose bottom line is the dignity of work and respect for workers. This includes fair contracts, just wages, and a voice on the job. A lot of domestic workers in this country, they're not included in a lot of the labor laws and protections. That's why we need to fight for the rights of domestic workers here in California. We dream of a world where people have security in their jobs and have benefits like health care for all, when we don't have to choose whether to put food on the table or buy medication and see a doctor for our kids. We dream of a world where people have a roof over their heads and a warm bed to sleep at night. Very basic. We dream of a world where people are respected regardless of what they bring as individuals. Black, brown, gay, straight. You have a job, you don't have a job. Whoever you are, you are God's child and you have a place in God's church. We dream of a world where our children and youth can avail of quality education. Oh, the cuts to our budget. A budget is a moral document. It tells you, the people that look at your budget, where do you spend God's resources? Where do you spend the, t the time that God has given you? It's stewardship. So if you look at the state budget and the federal budget, where is it spent? It's spent at killing people overseas, bombing other people. Is it spent at, you know, really providing for people's health care? Is it spent to give you better education, hire better teachers, and train teachers. Usually these, reg the, these resources are reserved for those who can afford it. We dream of a world where people come first before profit and an economic and political system that values people and not corporate greed. Now we bring this gospel to the world and God seeks you and God's grace is beyond borders, beyond our sickness, beyond the call of our skin, beyond what human and church law declare to be right, beyond our, even our own sense of helplessness, beyond our wildest imagination. When I applied for political asylum in this country, because a lot of my, my friends and other clergy were being killed in the Philippines, I came in 03 as a grad student, and then suddenly the political situa situation changed, and People were being killed, activists, union presidents, community organizers, clergy. Anyone perceived to be progressive was a target. And my bishop said, it's, it's safer for you to stay there. It was a difficult decision to apply for political asylum. And during my interview, I came all dressed up as a clergy person to show her that I'm not going to be a bad person in your country, right? You've got to let me in. 
she had this question, she asked me, so, you're an activist, you've been doing all this like stuff in the Philippines, so if we grant you asylum, will you do the same things here? Ooh, I thought it was a trick question from, you know, UCIS, CIS, like this immigration, right? When I'm being asked, will I be a rabble rouser in their own country? Trick question. But I was kind of quick. The spirit was really there. And I said, I threw the question back and asked them and said, I said, do you believe in freedom of speech? And I was like, they, of course. This is the United States. It's all about freedom, right? Great. Do you believe in, you know, peaceable assembly of people <laughs> to redress government? Of course, this is the United States. I said, these are American values that I share. These are political values that this country has. I share that with you. And because you said yes, and we share the same political values, that's why I'm here. That's why I have courage to face you today. Because back home, we don't have that. And yes, I will be a rabble rouser in your country. I was granted political asylum, but it was really great because I thought it was witness because towards the end she said, you know, you're, you're one, probably she's very, she's probably got burned out by religion. She said, you're one of the very few Christians I know who's really a Christian because of what you do. Because she asked me, what do you do as a minister? You don't have a parish? I said, the world is my parish, you know? I go meet workers, they're my parishioners. The streets is where I could, this, that's my pulpit right there. She didn't understand that until I tried to explain to her, it's a ministry. My church does that work. It's an extension and a part of God's work. Now, you and I are being called to something very difficult. We live in very difficult days. But I'm so excited about 2012 that I feel that there's something that's going to happen. But we need to be part of that. We need to be like Samuel. We need to be like Jesus. We need to be like Martin Luther King Jr. Just take that step of faith and say, yes, I'll be there. Difficult message, I'll be there. Remember, God will provide. God will provide. God bless you. Consider how the message landed with you and what might be awaiting you in your voice mailbox. <laughs>